Okay, I'll share the screen. Okay, uh, can you see the screen? Is it visible for everyone? Okay, all right. So uh, last time we were doing uh, waves and oscillations, right? And we talked about a simple harmonic motion. Uh, and that's actually the, uh, the motion that we'll be uh, concerned with uh, in this entire chapter. So we talked about well, what is a differential equation? Uh, how does a differential equation apply in our case? I showed you how uh, Newton's second law is just uh, really a linear differential equation. Uh, uh, and uh, from that, we talked about this thing that is an acceleration and how can I write down an expression for uh, the force the restoring force of something that is oscillating, right? So for example, uh, if I consider again uh, a pendulum, let me draw uh, something like this. And now the mean position is this vertical uh, line for this pendulum to rest at. And the restoring force of this oscillation is which is to the center of or towards the mean position, right? And that restoring force is given by this expression. And the negative sign is just telling you that the force is directed towards the center instead of outside where I pulled, I pulled the bob outside, right? So the negative sign shows that the force is in the opposite direction of where I pulled the bob, which is inwards to the center of the, uh, to the, to the mean position, right? So <clears throat> you can also think about it in terms of a, something that is called a simple harmonic oscillator. And in fact, this is the system that we'll be very closely working with uh, it is, in fact, the simplest uh, mechanical system whose motion follows uh, this linear differential equation. Uh, and it has these coefficients, which you can see this m uh, mass and the oscillation frequency. Uh, these are uh, some of the constant coefficients. And uh, so, we have multiple uh, examples of this thing, right? I mean, you can consider a simple harmonic oscillator that is a horizontally uh, on some surface. So here we have some spring that is attached to any mass, right? M mass. The spring, uh, the geometrical and the materialistic nature of the spring defines the spring constant K, right? So now imagine that if this mass was resting in this position and I were to displace it some distance x from its mean position and then leave it, then because there is a spring, it's going to oscillate uh, in this way, right? Back and forth until and unless it eventually comes to a stop at its mean position. All right, so this is a simple harmonic oscillator and you can write down the equation for force for this thing as well, which is F is equal to, now the restoring force for such an oscillator is minus K times X, where I have already told you that K is a, a spring constant and it's a constant, right? and it depends on the type of the spring that we are using. X is the displacement from mean position. 
right? So if I have some, if I displace it and I know how much I've displaced the block and I know what kind of a spring that I'm using, then I can compute the force with which this mass M will be directed back to its mean position, right? So this is that force. It's also called the restoring force. All right, so uh, is this uh, clear? Is the idea clear? Uh, can you please uh, unmute yourself and uh, let me know? If you're following along, is there any question? Uh, Alicia, Hasib, Omar, uh, Anna. Yes. Okay. Uh, are you following along? Is there any question? Uh, are you getting it? Yes, sir. So, so you understand what's a simple harmonic oscillator? Yeah. Do you understand these equations? Yes. You do? All right. So, uh, well, again, if I'm saying that it's really just an oscillator so far, uh, but if I say that it is, a, it is a simple harmonic oscillator, then as we discussed in the previous class, uh, it should be following the simple harmonic motion. And uh, what were the two conditions for a simple harmonic motion? The first one is for any oscillatory motion that it's a periodic uh, oscillations or periodic motion, right? Now, second condition, which is the most important one for simple harmonic uh, motion, and that is that the acceleration, which is directed towards the center to the mean position, is proportional to the displacement, right? So the acceleration is proportional to the negative of displacement. Negative sign is again ensuring that it's towards the mean position, right? And here from here, we develop this equation that A is equal to minus some constant times x, it just turns out that this constant is the square of the angular frequency of the oscillations. I I'm sure uh, you must be familiar with this thing that this angular frequency is just defined as uh, a frequency multiplied by two pi. Two pi ensures one cycle, right? So one two pi is, this is in radians, two pi radians. And that's just 360 degrees, which if you're uh, familiar with is just the complete revolution, right? So one cycle, so that, that's why we multiply a factor of two pi with this frequency to get an angular frequency for one complete revolution. If you're further familiar with the fact that the frequency is defined as one over the time period, where I'm sure that you know that time period is the time that it takes for one oscillation to take place. One oscillation is, for example, for this bob, if I move it here, then it's gonna come to its mean position, then it's gonna rise some height over here, and then it's gonna come back to its mean position, and then it's gonna rise some height over here. Now, this thing is one oscillation, right? So this thing is one oscillation. And that's the, uh, the time it takes for this to happen is the time period, and this is F. So I can write down this uh, uh, angular frequency as two pi divided by the time period of the oscillation as well. All right, so that's uh, your simple harmonic uh, motion. And these are the very main uh, conditions for a simple harmonic uh, motion to take place, right? Now, uh, we know I'm going to uh, describe some of the graphs very quickly uh, for displacement, uh, velocity, and acceleration. So let's see uh, how these uh, graphs look like. Displacement, velocity, and acceleration. All right, 
So, uh, of course, these graphs will be uh, drawn considering the fact that we're talking about a periodic motion. And we'll use uh, some of the mathematics, uh, help from mathematics, really, uh, to have a function that is periodic. In mathematics, uh, what type of functions are periodic? Can anyone uh, answer this question? Uh, can you unmute yourself and uh, answer? Uh, does, is, is, is anyone familiar with uh, what are periodic functions uh, in mathematics? Uh, functions like, you know, uh, let me write over here. Periodic functions are functions like a co cosine, sine, right? And uh, then you can have these hyperbolics and then square of these functions. And uh, you can make a lot of functions out of these fun these two functions, really, right? So uh, even in fact, uh, the tangent function is uh, made out of these functions, which is sine by cos, right? Uh, now, uh, it turns out that mathematicians have already developed the mathematics that we needed to study vibration, vibratory motion. And this is the uh, trig trigonometry is that mathematics. And so we'll use that to, uh, to understand uh, these harmonic oscillations, right? So for example, suppose uh, your solution can be either cos or sine, right? So suppose that I, have uh, this, uh, I have a system of uh, an oscillator or any uh, periodic motion, then I can, I'll have a displacement time graph for that uh, motion. Let's say displacement is represented with X, T is time. We know when an oscillation happens, I'll draw uh, the figure over here as well for you. We know initially what happens normally is, that something is resting in its mean position. So it will be on this dotted line really before. Then you move it. So what you're doing is you're increasing uh, the displacement. And then what happens is that the, the displacements, uh, this distance X starts to decrease when it comes back towards its mean position. Eventually it comes to zero when it's at its mean position. It's uh, X is equal to zero over here, right? X is zero over here and X is some maximum value X not over here, right? So this uh, maximum value is some value X not, I'll just call it, it's just a number, it's the maximum displacement that I can give to uh, this Bob. And then it starts decreasing, right? First it risk, and then now it's decreasing, it's gonna fall to zero. When it's at zero, physically the pendulum is uh, over here right now, when it's at zero, and then it's going to increase in the other direction, right? So it's going to move, rise over here. So that's why uh, the, the displacement becomes negative. And then it comes back again, uh, when it raises over here, then it's gonna come back and it eventually it's going to also come back to this mean position. So it's gonna go to zero again. And when it's at this point, this is minus the same number X naught. Minus just tells you that uh, it is uh, on the opposite side. So it's the opposite extreme position of the bob, right? And then it falls to zero here. It's at its mean position. So this is just one complete oscillation. Multiple of these will happen. And finally, eventually it will come to a stop. So you can repeat this graph uh, over and over and over again. And so you get something like this. And then it keeps on repeating itself, right? So this is the displacement versus time. Uh, is this clear? Is the displacement versus time graph clear for, for an oscillation? Yes. It's clear, okay. <coughs> All right. So uh, we know that uh, if I want to draw a velocity time graph, so I'll just velocity time graph 
uh, we know velocity is just displacement over time or in other words i can write the same thing as it is the gradient of displacement time graph right because the gradient of displacement time would be x change in x divided by change in time right that's the gradient of a displacement time graph that's the definition of how you find a gradient of any a curve or a slope and uh, so that's we're going to use this technique that the gradient of a displacement time graph will give you a velocity time graph so now it's very simple to draw a velocity time graph corresponding to this displacement so i can see now how did the velocity changed with time right so here we have uh, these axes. Let me just try to draw it like this so that we have everything synchronized. This is the velocity and this is time. Now, let's see. Uh, initially, we know that if I raised this pendulum, this bob, and then I release it, it's going to have the highest possible velocity uh when it is at the center and then it's going to rise again and why do i say that uh if you're familiar with the uh, conservation of energies then you know then when the bob is at raised at some height right at some height it's raised at this point it has the maximum of potential energy and then when its height is minimum that's when it have uh, which is over here at the mean position that's when it have the maximum kinetic energy right so when it's at the center when it's crossing the center it has the maximum speed right so the velocity starts as a maximum uh, the easy, uh, so you can i'll tell you uh, this technique by looking at the graph and looking at the physical situation and then drawing the graph and then i'll tell you a very simple technique in which you can draw a velocity time graph from a displacement time graph so by looking at the physics of what's happening uh the uh, as i've told you that at the center when time is zero t equals zero is at the center mean position the kinetic energy is the maximum, meaning the velocity of the bob is the maximum. And then eventually, as it raises to a height, the kinetic energy starts to fall, but the potential energy starts to rise. So when the potential energy rises, the velocity becomes uh, smaller and smaller, smaller and smaller, and eventually it drops to zero. And then again, when it's at uh when the velocity is at zero it is at a particular height right so for example it's over here at this point the kinetic energy is minimum so velocity is minimum but now it's going to uh, change its direction and start oscillating in this direction so again the velocity starts increasing 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 and it becomes a maximum at some point in the opposite direction that's why it's a negative number over here right and then you can continue the same thing like this and so on right so ignore the uh the a neatness of the graph but uh hopefully uh is the idea clear uh how did i do the velocity time graph and uh the displacement time graph yes yeah. or all right so understanding the displacement time graph is the most important because now if you uh if you use a a trick borrowed from mathematics uh, you can just write, draw a velocity time graph instantly because as i said that the gradient of a displacement time graph is a velocity time graph gradient is uh yes yes exactly uh, uh, so uh if the displacement time graph is a sine 
curve, then the displays, uh, then the velocity time graph would be the cos curve. And the reason for that is what I'm getting uh, into right now, because I have defined velocity time graph as the gradient of the displacement time graph, which is, is how it is. Uh, we know that uh, if we talked slightly about derivatives and last time I understood that there are some people who do not take mathematics. And so derivative essentially is uh, the time derivative as I explained. So for a displacement, if I say delta x by delta t, then loosely speaking, I can say that this is derivative of x with respect to time, right? We make, uh, we do an entire thing. We say that uh, we make this delta t interval so small and uh, that's when it converts into a derivative operator. But for now, uh, you can say that anything that looks like this, can be written as a derivative dx by dt like this. If that's the case, then uh, the if I have a sine function, right, the derivative d by dx or d by dt of this thing is a cos function. And if I have a cos function, then a derivative of this thing is a minus sine function. Right. So if you remember this thing, if you remember this thing, then if I have uh, a displacement graph, which looks like I'm going to draw an, a, a, a cos function now, which looks like this. And then the velocity time graph will be a sine function, but with a negative signature. So it will start it will be it will look something like this right so this is the negative sine function so this is the velocity time graph so all you did was you understood what derivatives are right and so the sine uh, the derivative of the sine function because derivative behaves like a gradient right it is a gradient really so the gradient of a sine function, which is displacement maybe, is cos function, which would then be the velocity. And if the displacement is a cos function, then the gradient of that thing, which is a derivative, would be a minus sine function. And then drawing this graph is essentially very simple. The velocity time graph is very simple to draw. Uh, by just knowing which function is which, right? So we know that minus sign looks like this. Okay, so uh, is that clear? Uh, is it clear? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, all right. So good. Now the final thing uh, for these graphs, uh, one of the graphs that's left is the acceleration time graph. And it's the simplest one simply because of the fact that remember uh, that acceleration was minus omega squared X. This thing is a constant. We can ignore it for now by, while we're drawing graphs, cons uh, multiplying a constant with something just uh, changes its amplitude right, but does not change the shape of the graph really. And because we see that A is the same as X, right? The same meaning it's proportional to X, right? So A is proportional to actually minus X, right? So if, if I have a displacement time graph that looks uh, something like, <clears throat> something like this, uh, sorry, this is a displacement time graph. Suppose it looks something like this, right? Then the acceleration time graph should look a flipped version of this thing, right? Because of this negative sign, the maximum amplitude becomes the minimum amplitude. So it becomes, it looks, it will look something like this, where it have now become a negative sign, right? And then the minimum becomes the maximum like this. But the shape stays the same as of the displacement time graph 
because it is just proportional to this thing, right? So if x was a sine function, then the acceleration time graph will also remain a sine function, but just flipped upside down due to this negative signature. Similarly, if it were a cos function, that looks something like this. Displacement time was a cost function, then the acceleration time corresponding to this one would be a negative cost function. So if it's starting at maximum over here, now an acceleration would start at a minimum and it would look something like this. So the minimum of this thing would be the maximum in the acceleration like this. And then, then again, the maximum in displacement time would be a minimum in the acceleration time graph. So uh, is that clear? Yes. So this thing corresponds to this point. Uh, this one corresponds to this point while this one corresponds to this one. All right, so uh, so far, uh, all of these graphs, uh, are they clear? Uh, displacement, acceleration, and time. Uh, sorry, uh, displacement, velocity, and uh, acceleration graphs. All right, so uh, okay, so now uh, we can talk about. Uh, are you familiar with the idea of uh, amplitudes of oscillations? Uh, amplitude of an oscillation could be uh, it is the maximum value of any of uh, these quantities. So for example, if you're talking about a displacement, the amplitude of this oscillation is the maximum value that the displacement can have. So this is defined as the amplitude uh, of the displacement time graph or the oscillation uh, that is happening, right? Okay, so... Uh, we can talk now uh, even about this thing. Uh, it's uh, energies of a simple harmonic uh, motion, right? Uh, you're all familiar with a work energy uh, thing where we also see that we can relate uh, energy with force. And so now we'll use that thing uh, to understand uh, energy and simple harmonic uh, motion, right? All right, uh, I think uh, before I come to this thing, uh, or, or I guess uh, let's, we should, we can start with this. Okay, so of course we know that uh, when uh, we have a, an oscillatory motion, right? So suppose you have a bob again and it's oscillating, there is this exchange of kinetic potential, then from potential to kinetic, and then again from kinetic to potential, as in here we have maximum potential, here we have maximum kinetic, and then when it comes to this height, we have again maximum potential. And then as the oscillations happen, uh, the this transfer of uh, continuous transfer of energy uh, keeps happening, right? So now uh, the, you can say the important point is again, uh, one of the most important principles of physics, it is conservation of energy. That yes, of course, this uh, transfer of energy happens, 
but the total energy is conserved, right? It is a constant, it does not change. The total energy of our system uh, does not change, right? So if I take the potential energy and the kinetic energy, the sum of this will be a constant number, right? And this number will not change. So if I were to draw uh, the kinetic energy of my oscillations, uh, with respect to the position of the system, right? So here I have kinetic energy and here I have the position of this uh, system. I've already discussed this thing that at the center, we have maximum kinetic energy. So when the object is uh, at its zero displacement, it's going to have a maximum value of kinetic energy. And as it oscillates, it is going to drop its kinetic energy and eventually come to zero at the maximum displacement where the potential energy is now maximum. So this thing will look something like this. And the same thing happens on this opposite side as well, right? So when it comes back to its center, uh, it again becomes maximum. And then on the opposite side, it reaches its maximum position where the potential energy again drops, uh, sorry, the kinetic energy drops to zero. Right? So this is some positive X naught and this is some minus X naught, X naught being the amplitude of the oscillation. So uh, is that clear? Is this uh, energy, uh, kinetic energy versus displacement uh, clear? Uh, why does the shape of the graph look like this? Uh, that's uh, the thing that you should be understanding right now. Comparing it with the physical situation that's happening. So is that clear? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. <clears throat> So uh, now I want you, uh, all of you or anyone volunteer to tell me that uh, how should I expect the potential energy graph with respect to displacement? I'll give you a hint that uh, it's either the kinetic energy or the potential energy. It's an exchange between the two, right? So Sir, opposite to the yeah. kinetic energy. Opposite to the kinetic energy. So you're saying that when the kinetic energy is maximum, then at that point, the potential energy should be a minimum value. And when the kinetic energy is the minimum, then the potential energy should be a maximum value. So it would look something like this. But the same thing is happening on the other extreme position. So we'll draw a mirror image, something like this. So it's a parabola like this, where this thing corresponds to a one mean uh, maximum extreme position, while this corresponds to the opposite uh, mean pos uh, extreme position, right? So. That's, uh, is that clear for uh, everyone? Does everyone understand why is this graph uh, the opposite of the kinetic energy graph? Yes, so. Okay, okay, good. So, and now remember, remembering the conservation of energy, uh, how should the total energy graph look like? Uh, here, let's suppose that I'm writing the total energy and here is the position. Uh, I write down the conservation of energy that the total energy is the sum of kinetic and potential energy, which is a constant, right? So 
how should that look uh, if I draw it against the mean position? Suppose here is the maximum uh, and here is the minimum. Anyone? Uh, it, it should be a constant number, right? So suppose the total energy will obviously be greater than zero. That's clear to everyone, right? The total energy of the system will not be zero. 